This is Cheryl Letterly from the Library of Congress, and I welcome you to this, our second annual online conference for teachers. And it is my pleasure to welcome Sherry awesome. Levitt. Sherry is the Executive Director of Teaching with Primary Sources, Northern Virginia, delivering professional development to K-16 educators throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Prior to her current work, Ms. Levitt was the High School English Language Arts Curriculum Specialist for Fairfax County Public Schools. She holds an advanced degree in English with 25 years of classroom experience as a teacher and department chair. And Sherry, we are delighted to welcome you this afternoon to share your knowledge and experiences. Hello, everyone. I, I'm just so glad to be with you today. I, I hope everybody's comfortable, settled in, and that we'll have some useful and, and enjoyable time together. Uh, from my many years as an English and humanities teacher, I know, and I think you'd agree, that students love a great story, particularly if it really happened. I think the true stories embedded in primary sources often offer irresistible invitations to students to find out more and along the way learn good habits of scholarship and attribution. And really that's at the heart of my presentation tonight. I'm going to model an approach to student inquiry and research that captures the theme of this year's conference discovering and exploring primary sources from the Library of Cong Congress. And um, I hope we'll look at some intriguing stories from one year in our nation's history. So the primary source images you'll be seeing are all hyperlinked, uh, so you can find your way back to anything of interest. And the images come primarily from the prints and photographs collection, historic newspapers, and the very excellent teachers page that has easy access educational resources for all of us. And throughout this presentation, please, I welcome your reflections and ideas. And maybe you've tried something similar, you suggest adaptations. I'd love to hear from you. From a student's perspective, I think history can be so confusing. And, and um, it's like a puzzle, maybe, with a thousand pieces. And I think confining an investigation to some of the events from just one year in our history can act as a sorting mechanism and then as a mirror reflecting forward to our own times. Uh, so here's the challenge to students. Um, I like project-based learning very much and I have incorporated some of the ideas in this uh, model. And um, I've issued here a challenge uh, to students to investigate the events of one year in history and then match with primary sources and make connections to our own times. And please note the date on the photograph there and perhaps you're in that same comfortable lounging position as we work together. So the role of the teacher in, in this um, project idea is to decide the course standards and the learning goals and, and really to develop um, the plans in advance so that once the challenge has been issued, the teacher acts more in the role of a, of a facilitator. But um, really there's a lot of deliberate design of structures, routines, and guidelines that push students toward completion of a project, encapsulating core standards, skills, and learning goals. So it's a very deliberate building of this before it even gets underway. Um, a good approach is to provide rubrics and graphic organizers for the important steps and always with flexibility because adjustments will inevitably um, uh, inevitably require uh, some, some flexibility. And of course a teacher ensures balance by requiring focus on a variety of categories but across a broad spectrum of categories please. So, uh, there's cultural, social, political, economic, scientific, environmental categories so that the project doesn't just become one year uh, of sports. Uh, and of course, analyzing primary sources. And we'll talk about a good way to do that in just a bit. And uh, to go deeper than just having the primary sources simply illustrate the event. And throughout, the teacher works with students conferring supporting, differentiating is needed, 
and assessing at every step, keeping students on track. These assessments could be daily logs, journal entries, peer evaluation, exit tickets, focus groups. You probably have some more ideas. And certainly a detailed bibliography would be an important part of a summative assessment. And I'd also like to recommend some flexibility in the date range, and I've done that here. I've taken a few liberties. Uh, sometimes the bibliographic record of a primary source um, isn't all that clear, and, and every single item at the Library of Congress does come with a bib record, but um, sometimes a specific date is a little nuanced. And the role of the student. Uh, the student chooses a year far enough removed in time so uh, that they'd be likely to have sufficient primary sources, even from the world's largest library, to avoid frustration. And, and also time to investigate several choices before a final decision. So it goes without saying that each group should have a different year. And the teacher should ensure that students can identify a primary versus a secondary source, and also the various formats in which primary sources uh, can come, and to think about the skills they are developing as they work through the steps toward the final pro product, uh, collaboration, critical thinking, problem solving, and building content knowledge as well. So in project-based learning, an audience, which ideally includes people outside the classroom, is a wonderful idea, maybe parents, teachers, specialists. And, and the final project options can take many forms. Magazines with articles, poems, political cartoons, performances, uh, website design, video. And during their presentation, their public presentation, student groups should be prepared to share and discuss their choices, to process and field questions from the audience with attention to good oral communication skills. So you um, might have guessed I've chosen 1920 to model how this might look. Uh, I've always been interested about the concept of decades as if somebody flips a switch and suddenly it's the Gilded Age, the Roaring Twenties, or the Great Depression. I mean every year has significant events, some more than others. Um, and the question for students again is why is the year whatever they choose, important in our history, and how does it connect to our own times? So listed on the slide are some of the people, events, and places I encountered as I consulted secondary source material. And perhaps you are familiar with the term zeitgeist, or the defining spirit or mood of a particular period, excuse me, period of history that's reflected in the ideas and beliefs of the time. And that's another aspect of this project, to capture some of that zeitgeist, maybe to develop empathy uh, for the real people who lived back then. So from a student's point of view, uh, where would I look to begin? Probably timelines would be a good idea. But, and, and if you were a student, how would you start the process of finding out about the events of one year? Um, well, for timelines, um, a caveat. Uh, because like so much else students encounter on the internet, timelines may be selective and not entirely free of bias. So students need to source and to verify. Uh, for example, I kept coming up with this claim. And I'll give you a moment to look at that. And I, I couldn't believe that possibly could be true. And yet, when I went to verify it, I'll give you a moment to read this. I found this 2013 blog from the Smithsonian Institution. So the teacher can help the process along by recommending some reliable timelines and requiring citation of the ones that students use. So once they've decided on the particular events to investigate, they can begin using the Library of Congress website to collect primary sources and make contemporary connections. But after locating a primary uh, source that looks promising. How do they um, how do they begin to really analyze it carefully? The Library of Congress, for many years, has had this um, valuable approach, a three-step approach, 
to analyzing primary sources, which is online with versions customized in a variety of formats. And this is the basic one with steps to um, observe and reflect and question. The circle in the upper right hand corner illustrates that it's not a linear process, but, um, but really a recursive one. So this primary source analysis tool can help students generate new questions for research. So let's see how this works. Let's try it ourselves with a 1920 image that I found in prints and photographs. So please take a moment now. I'm going to hold you to this for some time. I read somewhere recently from James Elkins, who's an art critic and historian from the Art Institute of Chicago, that, that people in a museum who visit uh, a museum found um, maybe spend an average of 10 seconds, sometimes up to 17, looking at an image before moving on, and that the Louvre found that people looked at the Mona Lisa for an average of only 15 seconds. So let's conduct our primary source analysis. Put yourself in the role of the student, and please begin listing everything you see in this photograph. Let me hold you here for a full minute and see what you can come up with, just what you observe. Okay, I'm calling time. And now please move on to um, your reflections, maybe the background knowledge you already have um, and questions. You might want to find out more. And what do you hypothesize? What's going on here? What would you like to find out? Well, fortunately, um, the Library of Congress has information for us in the Bib record. And I, I like that. The men seem to be some type of team. You're absolutely right, Mary. And they're learning the dance, but why? New perspective on sport training. Excellent. And that really is very close. Uh, the title of this photograph is The Charleston as an Aid to the Game. Vivian Marinelli is giving dance lessons to the members of the Palace Club basketball team of Washington, D.C. The subject of jazz and dance crazes appeared on several 1920 timelines, so I consulted a uh, historic newspaper collection chronicling America. Here it is. Um, it, it, this is a great resource for teachers. It's a database of historic newspapers published between 1836 and 1922. I used the search engine uh, and uh, the date range for 1920 to find articles about dancing and came up with this one. Spend a moment to read the headline from the Chattanooga News and record, please record your reaction to this and any contemporary connections you can make. The name of the database is Chronicling America and as Cheryl noted, there's a session on, on that tomorrow and and really, I see my colleague Cynthia Swiatkowski on the chat, and, and she and I, we love this resource when we work with teachers. <laughs> the alliteration overkill, absolutely. Um, so this led me to um, recommended topics. This is a feature in Chronicling America that's especially valuable for student research. Uh, it lists subjects widely covered in the American press in that date range, and it's searchable by alphabetical listing, subject category, and date range. It makes for fascinating browsing. It's almost a little dangerous when you're supposed to be doing other things. Um, but here's where I found the connection between the dance crazes of 1920 and jazz music. Uh, and you can read the little descriptor at the top. They're back, um, there are the selected best pages on the topic, as well as background information. And um, dancing was on jazz music, often described as immoral, ugly, and ridiculous. And I even found an article from the New York Tribune that read, jazz is responsible for most of the evils, say teachers. And an aside about these historic newspapers, advertisements, talk about the zeitgeist, uh, wonderful windows into the past and a feeling for the time period. Take a look at these, especially that one in the middle. Three examples from 1920 from the Washington Times, and maybe imagine how your students would react uh, and what connections we could make to our own advertising and media. 
<laughs> the generation gap never does change. On every timeline and text, I consulted about 1920, the 18th Amendment figured prominently in major events. And um, as you probably know, the 18th Amendment prohibited sale and transport of alcohol. But I learned that the ideas about controlling alcohol began more than a century before. And that's an interesting story and a research project for another time. Uh, you probably also recall that the 18th Amendment caused widespread disregard for the law and a surge in organized crime before it was repealed in 1933. And here we have a photograph, admittedly a posed photograph, but that's still a primary source. And it's a deputy Pol police commissioner, John A. Leach, watching agents pouring liquor into a sewer following a raid. And I wonder what connections you can make to our own times. Such a waste. So here's another interesting photograph I found this time in Chronicling America that might spur students to grapple with some text features and practice their literacy skills. Um, what words grab your attention as you look at this? And what do we need to find out and how are we gonna go about it? Bootlegs, absolutely, bootlegs. Uh, it's, all you have to do is look in a good dictionary, and most agree that a bootlegs uh, refers to smuggled liquor that's hidden in boots. Um, a czar, you know, we think of uh, a czar, an environmental czar, a um, legislative czar, uh, as a modern term, but here it is, 1920, and uh, the office of the prohibition czar, and uh, we have Miss Hattie Clowens, and then the uh, caption there. So um, I have a bonus crime question for you, if you recognize. I couldn't resist including this man because I was shocked that it went so far back. I'm sure you've heard of Ponzi screens, schemes rather. This is a mugshot of Carlo Ponzi, who was up to shenanigans back in that this time period. I don't think you'd recognize him. And um, moving on to political cartoons, take a look at this one. It really provides a bridge between uh, the 18th and the 19th Amendments. Uh, the 19th Amendment was ratified on August 18, 1920, granting American women the right to vote, known as woman suffrage. And the Library of Congress has extensive resources on the subject, including this cartoon from a primary source set on the teacher page. Can you see what's written on the bottle? Uh, the bottle's label says injustice, intolerance, hypocrisy, and that scary genie is tearing at the woman's banner, and the banner reads, votes for woman. What's a connection? I think this would be something older students might puzzle out and interpret. And, and that is a question, how are these two issues conflated? Um, you know, some research might reveal that um, the groups that supported and pushed through the 18th Amendment might, might be dangerous allies um, uh, because of the 18th Amendment's subsequent problems and unintended consequences. I'm going to move ahead to make sure we cover um, more of the primary sources we have on women's suffrage. And here's sheet music and a poster image from the primary source set on the teacher, teacher's page. It's got sound files, photographs, letters, and maps, and, and really um, it's, it's just a wonderful aid in helping understand the subject. And, and there's also a free ebook version, a student discovery set. And through all of these, you know, the opportunity to examine persuasion and propaganda techniques in support of a cause and how this works today, how differently. Okay, wonderful um, images around the changing roles and perceptions of women in 1920. Take a look at the three of these differing perspectives um, and the connections we could make today. Yes, that says My Little Bimbo. That's a sheet music cover. 
uh, the elegant woman uh, at the bottom poster uh, is smoking a cigarette. And uh, the title of this one is Where There's Smoke, There's Fire. And in the middle, a photograph of a flapper girl, probably an authentic image as, uh, for a flapper, more authentic. And, and where do you think, or where do you think students would think the name flapper might have come from? Well, um, the term flapper, apparently, from what I can tell in my research, originated in Great Britain, where there was a short fad among young women to wear rubber galoshes and leave them open so that they flapped as they walked and the name stuck. Uh, and flapper became synonymous with a liberated young woman. Scandalous galoshes indeed. And again, the through line to our times, I think kids would immediately get the connection with what is considered interesting today. And again, a, a screenshot of Chronicling America, which I, I hope you'll you'll go investigate uh, background information and articles. And I, I, I found so much information here, primary source information. And popular culture reflected in the films of 1920. You know, a, a few of the timelines I looked at marked 1920 as the rise of the movie industry. And a comparison, I think, of today's popular culture with that of uh, past year in history would likely engage students very much and spark inquiry and research. And here are, are some of the library resources. Um, any resonance with themes and subject matter in contemporary film? I can tell you that I found lots of pirates and lots of cowboys, and that seems to be an enduring popularity. Um, I love this entry from the teacher blog. If you, I, if you have never used it, highly recommended addressing stereotypes and humor and historic film clips to view from the library's collection. And that movie poster in the middle, that's a nice accompaniment. But capturing cultural norms and societal values, nothing is, I think, as effective as some of these uh, primary sources. And I was fascinated by the Crimson Skull with an all African-American cast. Um, fascinating lures to research. I want to find out more, and I imagine you might too. And in sports, here's Babe Ruth at bat. Garrett is catching in 1920, and with the World Series about to get underway, with historic results, whichever team wins, here's a terrific uh, photo of Babe Ruth. And although the bib record for this photograph doesn't have much information, the page will point to related resources at the library, so there's always those opportunities. Here um, is a primary source set. Uh, as I read about baseball in 1920, I learned that Babe Ruth hit a home run out of the polo grounds. I learned that spitballs were allowed and that the Negro Leagues, as they were called, were first recognized. Um, but for further research, the library's teacher page has this wonderful set, Baseball Across a Divided Society, which students are likely to find of great interest. There are baseball songs, cards, letters, speeches, as well as information about some of the baseball greats like Roger Maris, Ty Cobb, and others. But what I like about this collection, it goes beyond simply offering interesting primary sources and looks at our national pastime through, through the lens of desegregation, the Jackie Robinson story, for example. And I would be asking students, are these issues still with us today? Are there through lines that we trace to our own time? And I want to say here, I, I know you all may do some, some related projects, something similar, and I'd love to hear the versions that, that you've created. And let's go back to Chronicling America, where I found the Black Sox scandal of 1920. Here it is. I think I've got an arrow. Oh, I don't. Okay, but you can read the headline there. Uh, the Black Sox Scandal of 1920. And, and really, baseball fans, I think, would immediately point to some contemporary scandals from our own time. And that's when I searched by the date range, I found there were some other very 
unpleasant and ominous undercurrents at work during the year 1920 and there the Ku Klux Klan adding thousands of members. This one's from my home state of Connecticut, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and I think the headline speaks for itself. And I found this as well. My research came across some startling statistics re regarding the growth of the Klan. Um, at its peak, almost 5 million members, up to some sources say 8 million, including members of Congress, several mayors and governors. And six years after this photograph was taken in 1920, uh, the Klan would hold a massive parade in, in Washington, D.C. I think that's such an important point, Cynthia. So it didn't just happen in a vacuum. You know, how did it happen? What were the influences that led to the rise of the Klan? And again, the parallels to our own times. As they develop their project and presentation, students can learn great habits of scholarship and attribution by avoiding Google images. As somebody earlier in the chat pointed to, that would be the you know the natural place where kids would first go. But um, the Library of Congress here's a screenshot of a typical bibliographic record from the library that accompanies the photograph from the previous slide. And I know that the um, print is small, but I especially appreciate the um, rights advisory. So no known restrictions. So you know it's copyright free. You can use it. And then also, this is a real boon to research um, citation guide in um, MLA, APA, Chicago style, I believe. And this, I, I was shocked to discover this. I had not known or ever heard of this, but uh, apparently in 1920, in Duluth, Minnesota, three men were lynched on June 15th. Three African-American circus workers, and their names are Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, Isaac McGee, they were attacked and lynched by a mob uh, because of rumors circulating that they had assaulted and robbed a teenage girl. Physicians' examination revealed no evidence that any assault ever took place, but apparently no one was ever punished for the murders. However, in 2003, the city of Duluth erected a memorial to the murdered men. And I imagine your students would be able to research and furnish modern day examples of um, this kind of racial intolerance. Lo and I love Mary Johnson's um, recommendation to co always collaborate with librarians. I certainly agree. There are other dark undercurrents during the year 1920. And this time, uh, this one, connecting indirectly maybe to world events. Again, back in recommended topics, I read about the Palmer Raids. And this is uh, a paper from Ogden, Utah, 1920, January 3rd. There had been bombings and strikes and Attorney General Alexander Palmer set about a campaign to crush suspected Reds. And, and that's how far back that term goes. Uh, and anarchists, and, and thousands were arrested and hundreds deported. Um, some connections to our own times, perhaps. So a time of high anxiety in, in America. And, you know, why? Why was that? And Cynthia, that's true. Let me go back. Cynthia notes the connection to Russia right on that same page. I, I meant to point that out. So. The time period, 1920, uh, these undercurrents from the interwar years. Uh, World War I had just ended two years before. And the so sense of loss and devastation uh, was captured in the literature of this, of this year. Here are some first edition dust jackets. I'll let you admire those. And a photograph, if you recognize who that is. If you said um, the Fitzgeralds, you would be right, uh, Zelda and F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, the expatriate writers living in Europe and uh, following World War I, you, you probably recall, became a great force in American literature. 
And uh, among the books published in 1920 over Main Street, I don't know if you've read that. Anybody read that? Very depressing look at small town life in America by Sinclair Lewis. This Side of Paradise uh, was the debut novel of F. F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, a real sensation. And um, also his collection of short fiction, Flappers and Philosophers. And you recognize who that is typing up there. That's Ernest Hemingway. And in 1920, Fitzgerald introduced Maxwell Perkins, the famous editor from Scribner's, uh, who introduced him to uh, Ernest Hemingway. So I would ask, why were they called the Lost Generation? What connections would we make to today, if any? The book on the left refers to the signing of the Treaty of Versailles on June 28, 1919, ending World War I. And you can read the, the title, The Greatest Moment in History, according to the authors. And Woodrow Wilson proposed a League of Nations, but debate over the U.S. membership is captured in the sheet music cover. It's uh, clever. And I found this very curious uh, jewelry. It's an anti-League of Nations emblem pin. And this would be a good one for students. I mean, how do we let people know what we are thinking today? And this is Cheryl. I've muted Sherry. I'm not sure that she can hear me, um, but I, I am obligated to end this session on time because we do have another session coming. Uh, I see the time is quickly approaching, uh, 10 minutes up. So, uh, I have enjoyed this very much, and I would love to hear it from you. And uh, there's the contact information where you can reach me.